Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Smoller. I am the Director of Educational Programs here with the Journey Through Hallowed Ground. Hello, everyone, and, and today we are uh, continuing our tour through different uh, journey sites as we visit today with uh, Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center. And we are joined by the Historic Site Manager, uh, Paige gibbons backus So Paige, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to share my screen because I've got some pictures for you all so that you all can see the site virtually. Perfect. All right, and so, here in Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center, uh, we are located here in Prince William County, Virginia. Uh, we have several different historic sites that are managed by my office, which is the Prince William Office of uh, Historic Preservation. And so you can see all throughout Prince William County, um, we have several sites that range from early colonial history to agricultural history, to Civil War history with a battlefield and a hospital. And here at Brunsville Courthouse Historic Center, we really focus on social history. They're right in the center of the county at number three. Uh, so with Prince William County and the Office of Historic Preservation, um, like I said, we have several different sites. We do several different programs. So throughout our presentation today, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sneak peek of some of the history behind Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center, which is incredibly special, especially this year, uh, because we are celebrating our 200th anniversary of Brentsville Courthouse uh, this year from 1822 until 2022. And so Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center is located in Bristow, Virginia. Historically, it was located in the town known as Brentsville. And so, what you see here in this image are two of our government buildings. We have our courthouse and we have our jail. And so you can see Brentsville Courthouse was historically a county seat. And so when Prince William County was actually originally founded in 1731, according to the General Assembly, your county seat had to be in the center of the population. Well, when Prince William County was created, it was about five times the size uh, that it currently is right now. And so there was no Loudoun County, there was no Fairfax, there was no Fauquier, no Arlington, all of that was Prince William County. And so you can even see here in this map from 1754, you have Prince William County and you have Fairfax County and that's it, which was created in 1742. And so because of that, Prince William County has actually had several different county seats because every time a new county was created, that changed the center of the population. And as a result, would require a change in the courthouse and the jail, as well as one other government building that we'll talk about in a little bit. And so you can see here from this map, you can see Prince William has had six different county seats, starting all the way on the Eastern end in Woodbridge, going out West towards Cedar Run, back to Dumfries, before finally making its way out to Brentsville. And so you can see here from this image that Brentsville is really centrally located. And that is one of the main reasons why at the turn of the 19th century in the early 1800s, why residents in Prince William County wanted to try and change the county seat from Dumfries along Quantico Creek to a more centralized location. And so in 1820, Prince William County did agree, they did decide that they would change the county seat from Dumfries to a new town created in 1820 known as Brentsville. And you all might be wondering, where does the name of Brentsville come from? And so Brentsville is actually named after the piece of land that was taken to be turned into the county seat known as the Brent Town Tract. And the Brent Town Tract was several hundred thousand acres and 56 acres were taken and set aside towards this town of Brentsville. Now the Brent Town Tract was owned by a family known as the Bristows. So if you ever find yourself traveling through Prince William County, you'll go through Bristow, Virginia, and that's where that name comes from. But the Bristow family during the American Revolution and all of the years previous, they were a family of British citizens. They were loyalists. 
And so after the American Revolution, we all know how that turned out. Uh, a lot of loyalists and those who were living in England who were naturally living here uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia had their land confiscated by the Commonwealth. And so as a result, they very easily had these 56 acres that were surveyed out to create the town of Brentsville. And so in this survey that was created in the 1820s, you can see all of the different plots that were surveyed out for the town of Brentsville that residents could then purchase to build homes, build businesses, as well as our two public lots. And so the two lots that you see there towards the top of the map are the two biggest lots. You have the public lot, which would contain three government buildings, including the courthouse, the jail, as well as the clerk's office, where a lot of public records were held, as well as a tavern lot. And the tavern lot would have one of about two taverns that were built in Brentsville that would function as a hotel, a bar, restaurant, a place for people to socialize. Uh, and get into debates and all sorts of kind of fun things. And so during the county seat, uh, when it was here at Brentsville, Brentsville for the most part was a relatively small town with the exception of what were known as court days. And so during court days, you had the government was essentially open for business you had the courthouse that was open and trials were being conducted. People would come there to pay their taxes. Uh, you might also on occasion have people coming to the town to vote. But this was also a time that when people came to gather there at the county seat. And there were a lot of different functions that would take place uh, during these so-called court days. You had people who would come to bring their wares, tradesmen. You had farmers who were bringing their excess goods to sell to markets. Uh, you had people who would come to socialize. Uh, this was when a lot of traveling shows or a lot of entertainment would come through and tournaments were held and, and pig roasts and festivities were held. And this is also when people just came to see one another and share the news and hear what was going on in Prince William County, hear what was going on among their neighbors, as well as to come and hear what was going on inside the courthouse as well. And so during these court days, you could have hundreds, sometimes even over a thousand people come to swell here to Brentsville uh, during these court days when the courts were open for session. And so not only did the courts and not only did the town have a lot of business during this time, uh, the Brentsville Tavern also did a lot of business during this time as well as you can imagine. And this is an image of what we believe the Brentsville Tavern historically would have looked like here. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, that building no longer survives today. And so you can see we have it outlined here uh, at the historic site so that visitors could see its relation and its close proximity to the three government buildings with the courthouse, the clerk's office, and the jail. And so here at Brentsville, one of the things that we are really excited about is that we still have a lot of our government buildings that still survive today with our courthouse and our jail. Uh, you do not historically find that a lot throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, however, one of our buildings is missing from our public lot, and that is the clerk's office, which you can see a rendition of what we believe it may have looked like. And so unfortunately, this building, which I would argue would be one of the most significant buildings here uh, in our public lot, because this is where all of those government records were held. And so you have wills, inventories, you have court documents, you have tax records, you have land records, uh, everything that a historian would want uh, to learn about what Prince William County was like uh, during this time period. But unfortunately, this building no longer stands today. And so, however, we do have another significant building that does still stand, which is actually one of our if you will, one of our newest historic sites that we recently were able to purchase and are now working to restore. And so we, while we do not have the clerk's office, uh, we do now have the Williams Dawes house, which is the clerk's office house. And so you can see here, one of the first clerks to work here out of Brentsville, you have Philip Devereaux Daw. 
And so he was the one who was writing a lot of these records, uh, keeping track of a lot of what was going on in the courthouse, a lot was going on, a lot of what was going on with these taxes, with these records. And so you can see here, fortunately for us, in one example of some of these uh, documents, he had very easy to read handwriting. Uh, unfortunately, that is not the case for a lot of the clerks who worked and operated out of Prince William County, but it's a great resource for us uh, to be able to have a lot of these primary documents, some of which are actually still uh, in the current clerk's office today in Manassas. But unfortunately, our clerk's office does not survive today, and that is because of the American Civil War. Uh, during the Civil War, you can actually see here in this image, uh, General Crawford's headquarters just down the road from us at Bristow Station, Virginia. And you can see the bricks there that are in that chimney uh, in this historic image. We believe those bricks are actually part of the clerk's office. And so over the course of the Civil War, Union soldiers dismantled our clerk's office to be able to use uh, those bricks in order to build chimneys, to build winter quarters, and as a result of that, the building no longer survives and a lot of those documents were left exposed. And some of them were stolen, some were vandalized, uh, some were burned. And so Prince William County is actually what's known as a burn county and that some of our historical records uh, from county history are missing that we haven't been able to find or recover. And so one of the interesting things, especially with some of these Union soldiers as they were passing through, is they actually vandalized some of these documents as well. So you actually see at the bottom of one of these books uh, that was historically in the clerk's office, it was actually written in and signed by Union soldiers. Uh, this is a little bit more of a tasteful note. You actually have some books that were bayoneted. Uh, some that were stabbed and have holes in them, some that were torn. And so unfortunately, like I said, some of those records are missing uh, that we are hopeful that we'll be able to recover some of them, but there may be pieces of Prince William County's history that we may never be able to find. And so while our clerk's office no longer survives, you can see the historic location of the clerk's office. You see in this image, uh, the ramp, in going into the white building right next to the courthouse. That was the historic location of the clerk's office. Uh, but going to next door, you have our courthouse, which still does survive, uh, started construction in 1820 and completed in 1822, 200 years ago today. And so inside our courtroom, the interesting thing is that here in Prince William County, back in the 19th century, you had several different kinds of courts that were taking place. Most commonly, you had what was known as county court. And county court was overseen by magistrates who served as both judge and jury. Uh, they were members of the community. They were not necessarily required to have legal training. And they oversaw a lot of the uh, civil and criminal cases on a more regular basis. If a case reached a certain threshold in which a certain amount of money was involved or capital punishment was involved, then the case would go up to circuit court in which a, his, a, a criminally trained circuit court or circuit judge would actually come to the courthouse and then you would have a jury serving over that case. And so the courtroom looks a little bit different than we are used to today. So you can see here from this map, you have the two boxes for the sheriff and the sheriff deputy. You have the clerk of the court who would be sitting in the center of the courtroom at the desk. And then you have the chief magistrate who would be sitting in the high chair with the magistrates next to him. Now you have to remember that the courts were not open Monday through Friday, nine to five, like they are today. So a lot of these cases were condensed into, a, into these court days. And so the attorneys who would be standing there on those benches would be waiting for their cases to come. When their cases were called, they would step down next to the clerk's office and interact with the magistrate and the chief magistrate or the circuit judge and the jury uh, to be able to handle their case. And so the front of the courtroom, you can see in the image, but the back of the courtroom is completely open as well because during these court days, 
this was another very popular uh, aspect in which people came to the courtroom to hear some of these cases that were being tried. Uh, you also had some particularly scandalous cases that would occur over Brentsville's history uh, that could uh, draw a pretty significant crowd. And so in this image here uh, of a courthouse in Hanover County, you can see it's kind of comparable to the Brentsville courthouse with the setup and the magistrates, but you can also see just how crowded it could get in the back of the classroom uh, in order to hear what is going on with some of these different court cases. And so one of these court cases, just to kind of give you an example, and again, a lot of these documents that we are learning this information from are the clerk's documents that have survived until today. Uh, this is the one case uh, that I shared with you today, which is the Commonwealth versus, versus Susan Sisson in October of 1874. And she was actually charged with trying to poison a man named John Nickel with arsenic. And so you have cases of murder, you have cases of um, poisoning, uh, scandal, but you also have cases of people arguing over money, cases of people arguing over property as well. And so Brentsville has a really interesting history where I could probably be here talking about some of these different court cases and telling you all these stories for the next couple of hours. And so I highly encourage you, if you all are interested in learning more about these court cases, to come and visit us uh, so you can actually step into our courtroom and we can tell you some of these stories as well. And so here inside the courthouse, not only do you have these court cases that are taking place, uh, but this is also where people would come, like I said, to pay their taxes. This is where people could also come to vote as well. And then this is also as the county seat uh, this is also where you would have armies that would muster in, militias would muster in, and this was also where you had entertainment as well. And so back behind the courthouse, there is an open field which has been open for 200 years that we call the public lot. And it's here in the public lot that residents would gather for a lot of these festivities, a lot of these markets, um, a lot of these social gatherings here throughout the county. And one of my favorite events that took place here at Brentsville back in the public lot took place in 1859. And you can see here, you can read a little bit from this article uh, called A Tournament US. Uh, this is actually an article from a British newspaper uh, that was published overseas that is known as The Punch. Uh, and it is essentially making fun of the residents here in Brentsville for essentially a medieval style tournament, as well as an ox roast and a dance that they had here in September of 1859. And I'll read you kind of just the first couple of lines. And it says, of all ridiculous ostents, especially for Yankee gents, what more absurd than tournaments, yet in America, snobbish, silly, vain display of bogus tilt and Shane Turnay on those last August 18th day came off at Brentsville VA. And so if you read that entire article, it goes into all of the different types of uh, tournaments that they had, all the different types of competing that they had for a fair lady's hand. And so this is just one example of one of the several different types of entertainment that took place here at Brentsville in this public lot. Uh, but not everything was joyful. Uh, you actually had a, a lot of intense moments that would take place here at Brentsville, uh, especially nearing the American Civil War. And it's here at Brentsville in the courthouse that Prince William County voted to secede from the Union and send a representative Epahotten down to Richmond uh, to vote for Prince William County, representing Prince William County uh, in the state vote for secession. And so with this vote for secession, in the beginning of the Civil War, you had several units that were mustered into service here from Brentsville, including the Prince William Calvary. And in that house across the street, the Williams Dawes house, uh, you actually had some of the ladies who had lived there, took an old American flag, they took some of their dresses, and they actually created and sewed a Prince William Calvary flag to present uh, to the soldiers who mustered in uh, in 1861. And so you can see 
from this plague, it actually still does survive and it is still on display here in Prince William County uh, at a local, or a local winery uh, known as the winery at Bull Run. And so while you do not have necessarily a battle that takes place here at Brentsville over, uh, over the American Civil War, we are incredibly close, just a few miles away from the Battle of Bristow Station. You do also have several soldiers who are encamped here over the course of Brentsville's history, including Union and Confederate soldiers, especially Hampton's Legion. And then you do also have several skirmishes that take place here along Brentsville's main street, now known today as Bristow Road, uh, with Iron Scouts, with Rangers that are traversing all throughout the area over the uh, over the course of the war. And so it's during this time period that we lose the clerk's office. Uh, and it's after the Civil War with Brentsville still being the county seat that Prince William County tries to rebuild or reconstruct uh, after the Civil War. And so with Brentsville being the county seat, it's also here, we believe out of the Brentsville Tavern where the Freedmen's Bureau uh, base their operations here for Prince William County. And so one of the agents who was part of the Freedmen's Bureau who worked out of Brentsville, his name was Marcus Hopkins. And so it was his job to try and help coordinate the education of African Americans so that they could better learn how to read and write and negotiate labor contracts. It was his job to try and make sure that these labor contracts with now freed African Americans were fair uh, as well as to try and make sure that in, in the courts at Brentsville, African-Americans were being treated fairly. And so uh, as, as you might learn with reconstruction, uh, historians a lot of the time uh, deem reconstruction widely to be a failure. And so the impacts of that would be seen throughout Prince William County uh, for many years uh, after reconstruction ends in 1872. But Brentsville's history doesn't end with the end of Reconstruction. We were actually the county seat for Prince William County until 1893. And so you have a lot of things that are going on over the course of those 70 years. And so, like I said, we could be talking all day about the history here of Brentsville Courthouse. And so what I'm going to do now is gonna kind of take you through the rest of Brentsville's buildings and give you a little bit of information, a little bit of a virtual sneak peek uh, and hopefully entice you all to come and visit uh, in person. And so through the, the next significant building that we have compared to the Brentsville Courthouse is the Brentsville Jail. Both of these buildings working in conjunction with one another. Uh, the biggest thing that we need to realize is that for the most part, the Brentsville Jail is not a jail like we imagine today. Uh, this is for the most part a holding place. And so once people are arrested, they are held in the Brentsville jail for about in about six cells, four cells for criminals, two cells for debtors until they are seen in the courthouse. Once they are seen in the courthouse, then they will receive their punishment, their, their jail sentence, whatever it may be. Um, but if they are acquitted and they are free, they are not free until they pay the jailer their jail fees. Because back in the 19th century, if someone was imprisoned, they were fined daily to get them to care for their food, their water, uh, taking care of the jail cells and things of that nature. And so inside the Brentsville jail, we actually underwent a huge renovation over the past couple of years where we've actually installed now the new Brentsville jail museum. And so it is a mix of historic exhibits. Uh, it's a mix of historical artifacts and, and recreating rooms. And this building is designed not only to give you an idea of how the Brentsville Jail operated, but it's also a, a museum for the town of Brentsville itself. And so to take you through the Brentsville Jail a little bit, you can see we have our orientation room, which highlights some of the different history here at Brentsville Courthouse going into the jailer's office, because unlike today, the jailer and his family, a lot of the times lived in the Brentsville jail. And so being the jailer was much more than a full-time job because it was him and his family who were in charge for caring for the prisoners, cooking 
and feeding them, uh, taking care of the cells, as well as all of the paperwork and accounting and security and things of that nature. So two rooms are dedicated for the jailer and his living quarters, office and living quarters. And then the rest of the rooms are divided into these cells. Like I said, criminal cells as well as debtor cells. Because until 1849, it was legal in the Commonwealth of Virginia, if you owed someone money, they could have you arrested and put into jail. Makes it very challenging in order to pay those debts off to get out of jail. And especially if you are fined for being in jail while you're in jail trying to work off these debts, makes it incredibly hard uh, to escape debtor's prison uh, once someone is placed in there. And so if someone was placed in debtor's prison or if the jailer had to essentially lease people out to work for hard labor in order to pay their jailer's fees, he had a certain bound within town that he had the ability to do so. So you can see here in this drawing of Brentsville, you can see the three buildings as well as the, the office, the courthouse, the jail, which you can see is spelled with the old spelling. And then you have the tavern and the outbuildings for the tavern. So you have our two public lots as well as a few lots across the street that they are able to work within uh, to be able to try and work off this debt. But like I said, it, it is very hard to pay off these debts when someone is put into debtor's prison. And so for that reason, the system was abolished in 1849. And so much like the Brentsville Courthouse has a very interesting history, uh, the Brentsville Jail has a very interesting history as well. And it has a very uh, dramatic history, if you will, or a, a very uh, difficult history as well. And so not only did you have criminals who were placed inside the Brentsville jail if they were arrested for a crime or being accused of a crime, you also have African Americans who are no. in prison in the jail who are yeah, listening being, into the you have you have African Americans who are imprisoned in the jail accused of being runaway slaves. Uh, you have people who have mental illness who are imprisoned in the Brentsville jail. Uh, because the knowledge and treatment of mental illness was not uh, was not to today's modern standards, if you will. There was very little knowledge about it. And so if someone was deemed uh, mentally insane, uh, they could just be placed in the jail awaiting a room in one of about three hospitals in the state, in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, to try and receive treatment. And so because of this, you have people who are, who do try to escape the jail, of one of whom is Landon, a slave in 1839, who actually tries to burn the jail down in an effort to escape because he is arrested being accused of a runaway slave. And so when he is brought to the jail, the chances of being proven free are, are very slim. And a lot of people realize this and so they try to do their best to escape. Landon tried to do this, but unfortunately, uh, the fire was caught, the fire was put out, uh, Landon was unable to escape, and his punishment for this was actually to be sold outside of the United States, most likely to the Caribbean, uh, into slavery on sugar plantations. And so you have a lot of this history here at Brentsville, uh, like I said, that we could be here for another several hours uh, talking about African Americans at Brentsville and how they were treated uh, within Prince William County uh, through our courthouse and jail. And so to just kind of give you an idea, uh, this is what one of our cells looks like towards the second half of Brentsville's history. Uh, this depicts the 1872 uh, jail cell for a man named James Clark. Uh, another scandalous story that we have here at Brentsville, James Clark uh, was the Commonwealth attorney who was essentially arrested when he, a 30-year-old man, fell in love and ran away with a 16-year-old girl named Fanny Fuel. And so as you can imagine, family was not very keen of this. Uh, they had actually claimed that she had been abducted, abducted taken against their will. James Clark was arrested and he was placed here inside the Brentsville jail to await trial. Uh, James Clark, he, he claimed that he could prove his innocence. He wasn't necessarily worried being here inside the Brentsville jail, but Fanny's brother, Lucian, had other ideas. 
for he had come to Brentsville and he had walked into the jail, walked up to James Clark's cell, put a gun between the bars and shot and murdered James Clark while he was in the jail cell awaiting trial. Lucian Fuel was eventually arrested. He was put on trial, but in 1872, he was actually acquitted uh, based on claims of not only mental, uh, mental illness and insanity, but as well as the, the effects that it had on a well-to-do family uh, here in Prince William County, Virginia. And so that is one of just one of the, like I said, many stories uh, that we could tell here at Brentsville that's a little bit scandalous, if you will. Uh, this was actually making newspapers in the Midwest, up and down the East Coast. And so it was actually a pretty widespread story here in the small town of Brentsville. And so you can see just an example of some of these newspaper articles. And here you can see his tombstone, which he was buried uh, here just on the boundary of Prince William County today. And so while Brentsville was the county seat from 1822 until 1893, Brentsville was a town for much longer than that. Uh, after the county seat moved, it moved uh, in 18, 1893 to Manassas, uh, to now what we call the old Manassas Courthouse. And it moved because after the American Civil War, the town of Manassas was being built up. A lot of businesses were moving there. It was a lot easier access with the railroad. And so Prince William County residents, again, petitioned for the courthouse to be moved uh, from Brentsville to Manassas, to which they were su successful in 1893. But you still had a rural community that still lived within Brentsville. And so with this rural community, uh, they built several different buildings that you need for a rural town, one of which is the 1870s Union Church. A small church here uh, within Brentsville, uh, it was actually almost in a sense a non-denominational church. It was used by a lot of different uh, congregations. You had Presbyterians, you had Pentecostals who had used it. It was also used as a little bit of a community center uh, from the 1870s until about the 1950s. Uh, in addition to this, there were several different schools that were located in Brentsville. Uh, once the county seat moved in 1893, uh, the courthouse was actually purchased by a local resident out of Noakesville named INH Beam, who actually turned it into the Prince William Academy. He had turned it into a school that was essentially a teaching school where people could get the degree of pedagogy. Uh, once that school closed, the Brentsville Courthouse became a public school for the residents of Brentsville until a new school was needed. And so in 1928, this school that you see here was built on the grounds of the original clerk's office where you had grades one through five that were taught here from 1929 until 1944. And so being a rural community, uh, the most students that were really ever taught out of the Brentsville Schoolhouse was about 30. And so again, 30 students, all grades one through five taught by one single teacher. However, with those buildings that were built and originally located at Brentsville, we do have one building that was actually moved to the historic site uh, in an effort to interpret how a lot of people here in Prince William County lived during the 19th century. And we do that with the 1850s Hazel Hall House, named after the two families who had lived there. Uh, this house is a middle, middle upper class farmhouse that you would find here in Prince William County, where it's a simple, essentially main room on your lower level, a hall, and then a loft upstairs that you had in this particular house, about 11 people sharing and running a farm. And so all throughout Prince William County's history and all throughout Brentsville's uh, history as well, we are a very social site. Uh, Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center is a site that it was prominent in the 19th century as a political, a social, a, rec a recreational, and economic center for Prince William County residents. And so when visitors come to visit Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center, we get to take you through all of these five different buildings to tell a comprehensive story of what Prince William County was like in the 19th century, not only focusing 
on those big time periods that we learn a lot about, like the colonial era, as well as the American Civil War. But we also talk about uh, talk about time periods that are not so commonly discussed, like the 1820s and the 1830s, as well as the Great Depression and what was happening here in the county during World War II. And so today, I've kind of just given you a sneak peek of some of the different buildings that we have in just a small little snippet of some of the stories that we have to tell here at Brentsville Courthouse Historic Center. Uh, and I am going to do a, a, a shameless plug here. Uh, with it being our 200th anniversary, it was actually very timely that I'm happy to come and give you all this virtual presentation because this Saturday, we're actually having our 200th anniversary uh, celebration and commemoration. So we are doing that with a, a court day that we're actually going to, in a sense, recreate these court days that would have been found here at Brentsville throughout the 19th century with markets and tradesmen uh, and living history demonstrations so that you can get an idea of what the town of Brentsville was like during the 19th century. And so thank you all so much for having me here online for this virtual presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? I would be happy to answer any. Yeah, Paige, a great timing, like we said, and I just <laughs> blown away with all the history that you guys have. Um, we do have some questions that came in. So um, Ben Kellerhals, he's our intern here with uh, Journey Through Hallowed Ground. He's gonna um, help us out with those. All right. Yeah, hi Paige, great presentation. That was a lot of great info there. And uh, let's look at some, a lot of our questions appear to be of, of similar themes. So maybe we can try and combine this um, more or less. Um, how, how do you, how does the site manage with so much history to cover and so many different stories to tell and so much space? Um, how do you manage that? Uh, what suggestions do you have? And how does the artifact process work in with that, with how the different um, aspects of the history um, stand out? So that is a really great question. And so here at Brentsville Courthouse, right, we have 200 years of history. And when people come to visit the site, uh, we generally give about 45 minute long tours uh, that are kind of a brief overview of Brentsville's history. Um, now our tours are very flexible. So I mean, the basis of a tour is about 45 minutes long, but there are times that we would be with visitors for an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, uh, just having great discussions about all of the history that Brentsville has to offer. Uh, but throughout the year, uh, if you go on to our website, we actually break up Brentsville's history into different programs and different tours that are based by themes. Uh, so we might focus one theme specifically on Brentsville's African American history. We might do another tour focusing specifically on uh, Brentsville's time as the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, we might focus specifically telling some of the different court cases. And so we break up a lot of that history uh, into different subjects for tours, theme tours, as well as different programs as well. And so we do those all throughout the year. So I highly suggest that you all come or check out our website, see when we're doing some of these different themed tours uh, to learn about Brentsville's like I said, 200 years of history. Uh, and as far as some of our artifacts go, uh, a lot of our artifacts that we have in our buildings are reproductions. And this allows us to be able to get really interactive with our tours. Uh, so for example, in the courthouse, uh, the courthouse has had to be completely renovated because it went through so many changes over the years from a courthouse to a school, to a community center, uh, to office space. And so we've had to essentially uh, reconstruct the interior of the courthouse to bring it back to its 19th century appearance. But by doing that, it allows a lot of the space to become interactive. And so, for example, in the courthouse, we will actually do mock trials. Uh, we are doing mock trials this Saturday where we will actually recreate some of these different court cases. Uh, we also bring the Hazel Paul House to life, if you will. We actually use the, the stone earth and we do cooking programs. And we have even in the past done overnight there in the Hazel Paul House if people want a true experience of what it's like to live in the 19th century. Well, that's awesome. Um, so many great resources there. It's great that you're sharing this all with us. Um, we don't want to take up too much of your time. And that, that was the gist of, of most of our questions there. So 
we want to make sure we have time to get your uh, answer to this. Uh, what advice might you have uh, for young people or anyone that wants to do something like what you're doing and maybe what uh, did your path look like to getting to work at this great site? Yeah, um, so I, I mean, I love my job. I get to come every day uh, to do something different, whether one day it's working with the collections and cleaning, whether or not it's giving a, a guided group tour or being open for regular tours uh, to doing research. And so no day is the same. And so if, if this is something that you're truly passionate about, and if this is something that people wanna try and get into the field to be able to get these kind of positions, um, I would recommend getting out there. Uh, and if you can, as early as you can, try to either volunteer or try and get an internship to just try and get your name out there. And so that people can see and know that you're passionate and that you have the knowledge to be able to do this. Um, when working out in this field, one of the great things about many of our historic sites uh, throughout Northern Virginia is that we all work together to share our history. And a lot of our history is so intertwined as well. And so that's the biggest piece of advice that I have is to just get out there and try and find ways uh, to make your yourself known as much as possible. Because when people start to see uh, how passionate you are and how hardworking you are, uh, that makes a big difference. Great advice. And uh, thank you so much, Paige, throughout for all of this. It was a wonderful presentation and um, look forward to coming and visiting in person. All right. Yes. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yes, of course. And good luck with the 200th anniversary celebration this weekend. I can't wait to look into it. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you back here next week. All right. Thank you all.